The Estadio Nacional in Lisbon, Portugal saw something that may never be repeated in football on a sunny Thursday, May 25th, 1967. No British team had won the European Cup before, let alone even make it to the final after 11 tries. Celtic made it there for the 12th edition. But while that was a record in its own right, the composition of the team is what's truly awe-inspiring. Hey there, I'm Adrian and welcome to Rabona TV, Quarantine Edition. A slower drip of content at this time, but the content will continue. Thanks to my guy João Oliveira for suggesting this video. If you have a suggestion, don't be shy about leaving it in the comments. That said, I left my sources in the description for you. Now, let's go back to the 60s for one of the best, most feel-good stories in the history of the game. So you've come to Glasgow, have you? Pretty grim, isn't it? Glasgow, before and during the 1960s, was a working-class industrial hotbed, a rough and tumble city that had its fair share of violence and poverty, and of course, the sectarianism that was prevalent throughout the town. In fact, according to Professor Sir Tom Devine as he spoke to the BBC, it was also the most densely populated city in Western Europe at that time. You can imagine the lifestyle and the people that would be formed by this type of city. Tough, proud, and hardworking. One of these hardworking men was John Jock Steen, who, before he was captaining Celtic himself, was working in the coal mines. After playing in Wales, he found his way back to Scotland via Celtic, captaining them to a few trophies, but ultimately being forced to retire due to ankle injuries. It turned out to be a blessing in disguise, however, for both club and Steen, as fate would put Steen in charge of the Celtic youth side, where he developed the young talent and, of course, his own coaching ability. However, that sectarianism that I mentioned earlier would become a problem for Steen in that Robert Kelly, the club chairman, said that Celtic would not be able to promote Steen to the first team manager role given he's a Protestant. In case you need reminding, the overly simplified explanation to this is that the old firm derby between Celtic and Rangers is rooted in a religious divide, Celtic being Catholic and Rangers being Protestant. So Steen signed with Dunfermline in 1960 as their coach, leaving Celtic, at least temporarily, with a very heavy heart, leaving behind those young talents he had helped develop. Though in 1965, Kelly contacted Steen to come back to the club, as Celtic were, at this time, trophyless for seven years now. Steen is credited with getting both Dunfermline and Hibbs on their feet, and he was tasked to do the same by Kelly at Celtic. However, the roots of the operation had been laid out in the 1950s by Kelly himself, as he allegedly looked to the success Manchester United's Busby Babes had in signing many local youth players to their academy. Celtic did the same, calling them Kelly's kids, and by the time Jock Steen had returned to Celtic in 1965, many of these local teenagers had matured to the level of the senior team at Celtic. Place these talented Glaswegians and the surrounding area teens with an extremely talented manager in Jock Steen, and you have a potent pairing. Jock Steen's presence was felt immediately at Celtic, as he was able to unlock the potential that these boys possessed, this team of Scottish talents that had been playing far too below their potential for years. After just two weeks with the club, Celtic won the Scottish Cup with a 3-2 victory over Dunfermline, snapping their trophyless run. As this story from the Times newspaper on the 26th of April 1965 says, Perhaps it is the spirit rather than the skill that Mr. Steen has instilled since his return to Parkhead a short time ago. In fact, with Steen at the helm, Celtic went on to win the league as well during the 1965-66 season, and in the 66-67 season, the 67-68, and on and on for nine consecutive seasons. In total, they won the league ten times under Steen and the Scottish Cup eight times. That first season under Jock Steen saw them win a league and cup double, and thus they qualified for the 66-67 European Cup, their first qualification in the club's history. During the 1966-67 season, they had picked up where they left off, scoring 26 goals in their first six matches alone domestically. This attacking style of play from Steen and the boys bled into the European form as well, as they eased through the first two rounds of the competition. Remember, there was no group stage at this point. First round, second round, quarterfinals, semifinals, final. Their first opponents were the Swiss champions FC Zurich, with Celtic's free-scoring left-back Tommy Gemmel scoring three of the five goals that Celtic put past the Swiss side. It wasn't uncommon for Gemmel to be a standout performer, 
just as it wasn't uncommon for Jimmy Johnston, who grew up a few miles away from him, to steal the show for Celtic. Johnston did just that against their next opponent, FC Nantes from France. Johnston was an incredibly skilled player, twisting and turning down the Celtic flanks, match in, match out, demanding the attention of the Nantes defenders in order to open up space for his teammates. Though Nantes were more of a challenge in comparison to Zurich, Johnston and the boys provided far more than they could handle, winning both legs 3-1 for a 6-2 aggregate victory. Celtic's next opponent provided their biggest test on the way to the final, Vojvodina, a team from present-day Serbia, but back then of course from Yugoslavia. Playing away in the first leg, Celtic suffered their first defeat of the competition as a lone goal from Milan Stanic gave the hosts the win and the lead as they travelled to Glasgow for the second leg. Playing under the lights of Celtic Park, Chalmers put Celtic back on level footing with a first half goal. As the second half wore on, the threat of heading to extra time loomed, but when Celtic most needed their captain and talisman Billy McNeil, he stepped up rising for a header in the 90th minute that flew into the back of the net, producing this iconic image where even in using his hands, the Vojvodina defender couldn't keep the header out. 2-1 Celtic, and their incredible run continued. Willie Wallace was new to Celtic for the 66-67 season, and was new to the European Cup when he made his debut in the semi-final against Duke La Prague. Prior to signing with Celtic, his form had begun to wane at hearts, but Steen believed he could help him find his way back on track, and that belief in the 25-year-old was repaid on his European debut, scoring a brace in a 3-1 Celtic win at Parkhead. A draw would be good enough to see Celtic to secure the tie away in Prague, and a draw was what Celtic achieved. A place in the final is what they won. The first British team to make the European Cup final is the label they'll have forever. But at this time, they still had business to take care of domestically before they could even think of taking on the Titans that were Internazionale or Inter Milan. In October, they had won the Scottish League Cup with a 1-0 victory over Rangers. Just over a week later, they secured the Glasgow Cup, beating Rangers, Queen's Park and Partick Thistle all 4-0 respectively. At the end of April, they won the Scottish Cup with a 2-0 victory over Aberdeen. In the league, however, Rangers were right on their tail and were their opponents on the penultimate match day. Given that Celtic were fresh off of their second loss of the season, both of which came against Dundee United, Rangers were just a few points behind them and had the advantage of playing at Ibrox for what was a title decider. Just as they had done in every other competition thus far in this historic season, Celtic got the result they needed, a 2-2 draw to secure the league title with a match to spare, ensuring that they had won every competition they had played in thus far, a domestic treble or a quadruple if you want to count the slightly less fancied Glasgow Cup as well. Watching from the stands was Inter Milan's legendary coach Helenio Herrera, the man who had led Inter to two successive European Cup titles in 64 and 65. If it weren't for eventual champions Real Madrid, he would have brought them to a third consecutive European Cup final in 1966 as well, but they lost in the semis 2-1 on aggregate. Herrera was widely regarded as one of the best coaches in the world, and to this day one of the best of all time. A man who eclipsed the players he had on the pitch, and who helped elevate the popularity of Catenaccio to unprecedented levels in Italy and Europe, with his own take on this tactical system of play. So despite their fantastic domestic season and their near flawless run to the final, Celtic was only ever considered to be the underdog in the final against Herrera's Inter. It was the defensive emphasis of Herrera's Catenaccio versus Steen's all-out attacking style with a virtual 4-2-4 system. Despite being fancied by few, Steen's team had belief in themselves, with Johnson embodying that belief as he demanded the attention of Inter's Facchetti, asking if he was in charge of marking him. A tough task to take on, despite the mismatch in size. Johnson was on it from the start, jinking around Inter defenders and testing Sarti early. Unfortunately though, the first goal fell to Inter after a penalty was awarded in the seventh minute. When a team like Herrera's takes the lead early like that, there was typically one outcome. They set up shop for the rest of the 90 minutes and see the result out. A total blackout as they try to control the game defensively and often did. But sticking to their game plan, Celtic continued to attack their own way of controlling the match. Attack after attack, close opportunities go wide, over the bar, off the bar, into Sarti's hands, but not where it mattered most. 
That is, until Craig rolled the ball to his left at the top of the 18, where Tommy Gemmel ripped it past Sarti to level the match in the 63rd minute, the left back scoring yet another important goal. Inter were shell shocked, while Celtic continued to run ragged all over the pitch. This team of local boys was cutting through the Catanaccio, forcing Sarti into save after save. That is until the 84th minute rolled around and Chalmers redirected Bobby Murdoch's strike past Sarti, 2-1 Celtic, 2-1 to the men who were all born within 30 miles of Celtic Park and who were joined by thousands more Glaswegians on the pitch at the final whistle. I feel like it goes without saying at this point, but let's go over why this was so impressive regardless. This Celtic team wasn't just made up entirely of talent from Scotland, but every single player grew up within 30 miles of Celtic Park. By today's standards, even Bobby Lennox, who had to travel 27 miles from Salt Coats to Glasgow, would be considered a local for most teams. And he was on the far end as far as proximity to Celtic Park. The opposite of which being Stevie Chalmers, who grew up with a view of Celtic Park. The man who scored the winning goal in the final. This group of like-minded individuals who had all grown up with a certain kind of hardship of their own, whether it be as one of the first survivors of tuberculosis, as Chalmers was, or living amongst poverty as much of the team grew up. Whatever their respective case may have been, they were a unified group, a group that went from playing on the streets of Glasgow to winning the European Cup. This was a truly local team, a local team that did something that with the way modern teams are constructed, feels like it will never be replicated. Just think of it. Only one player on this team was born over 15 miles away from Celtic Park, Bobby Lennox. Thus the often used, born within 30 miles of Celtic Park is used instead. If not for Lennox, their proximity would be even closer. When a team from Glasgow won the trophy, it was a team predominantly of Glaswegians that won the trophy, not stars brought in from overseas. And to me it puts other conquests in perspective now, as multinational sides win a trophy for a club in an area that they often have nothing more than a professional relationship with, at least when they are initially signed, as personal relationships with their surroundings can develop, of course. But it feels like never again a feat like this will be replicated. Local boys at the top of the European football pyramid, especially not in the post-Bosman era. Thanks so much for watching, my name is Adrian, I love ya, and take care.